So when I took over at North Carolina and I changed something that hadn't been changed for 36 years, it was very stressful for 69% of the population. Oh, I'll bet. Right? I'll bet, yeah. I should have gone slower with the change. So that was Coach Matt Doherty talking to Matt Smith on the United Basketball Leadership Podcast about the tough transition he experienced when he went from the University of Notre Dame to the University of North Carolina. And he was very successful at Notre Dame, but the UNC culture was not ready for the full implementation of his different way of doing things. I mean, they had had success, decades of success under Coach Dean Smith. So in the next two episodes, we're going to share some principles and strategies to help coaches that are taking over a new program. Uh, so that you can avoid maybe some of the challenges and problems that Matt Doherty faced. Uh, But I also think some of the things that we're sharing, I think they can be applied to any coach resetting their culture or just even starting a new season. Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast. I'm JP Nervin, joined by my co-host, Nate Sanderson. If you want to create a culture where people feel seen, known, and loved, and become better people for having been a part of your team, this is the podcast for you. So subscribe if you haven't already. And check us out at thriveonchallenge.com to learn more about our community and mentorship program. Also, a special thanks to our friend Matt Smith from the United Basketball and Leadership Podcast for allowing us to use that bit from his interview with Matt Doherty. It's a great podcast. Nate and I have been privileged to be guests on multiple times before. Matt's got a great basketball coaching clinic August 27th to 28th in Hoosier Gym. Uh, It's on the floor featuring live instruction. You can learn more about that at unitedbasketballclinics.com. So when it comes to taking over a new program, I think there's kind of two vastly different approaches. And I don't think it's necessarily necessarily you're choosing one or the other. I think it's a bit of a spectrum. But I think on one end of the spectrum here, um, when you take over that new program, it can be very much, you come in with a vision of how things are going to be, a vision for that culture, the systems that you're going to run, um, and really just kind of lay that out and just try to implement that the way that you see things at the other end of the spectrum though, is coming in and starting to first learn how things are in that situation and maybe slowly incrementally bringing about different changes. And I've got experience in both of them. And, you know, one, one was in 2012. I uh, took over at Notre Dame high school in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And honestly, I came in there with a vision of how things were going to be. And I came in and said, this is how things will be here. Things are going to change. And I kind of honestly, rather than sharing that vision, I was kind of maybe imposing that vision a little bit on my players. The same time when I took over Liffey Celtics in 2020, just last year, I took a vastly different approach. I went to the other side of that spectrum and I, I came in trying to first learn how are things currently going here? You know, where do you think things should go? And so I, it was just a v- much different approach. So as we kind of get going on this conversation, Nate, I know you've, you're taking over at Mount Vernon. And you have been doing a lot of information gathering. You've, you've been kind of coming in there trying to figure out where they are at. And I'm kind of curious what your process uh, has been around that. Well, JP, I know anytime you're taking over in a new place, you know, you're wondering, and probably a lot of people are asking you, what have you gotten yourself into? <laughs> in a sense, you know, you, you're trying to get a, a handle on the culture and the parent culture and the athletic culture and the level of commitment and the systems and strategies and how they've practiced and what they did in the weight room and how they interact with each other and what the bench culture is like. And, you know, we could go on and on and on about just trying to figure out where are they at, where the player is at, where's the program at, where the coach is at, where's the administration at. And I think that the more information that you can gather as quickly as possible, just the better perspective you have when he starts to come to the question of, all right, I know that I want to implement change. I know that I want to implement a lot of changes at Mount Vernon, but where do we start? You know, and that question is both, what are people open to when it comes to change? And where am I going to get the biggest return for my investment when I start to prioritize the areas that I want to address first? I just finished reading a book called The Big Three by Michael Holly, which is about the rebirth of the Boston Celtics when they put together the, the big three of Paul Pierce, Ray Allen, and and Kevin Garnett. And there's an interesting anecdote at the end um, of the story where they talk about Doc Rivers choosing to go to the Clippers and how he addressed the change in organizations and also what it was like for the Celtics to bring in Brad Stevens from the college level 
and give him a six-year deal to coach professional basketball with the Celtics at a level that he'd never competed at or coached in before. And they talked about the first thing that Brad Stevens wanted to understand was the Celtic mystique, you know, the tradition of the Boston Celtics and what that meant, you know, generation after generation, all the way back to Red Arbuck and Bill Russell. And what he did was he asked everybody in the building that he interacted with, essentially, what's it mean to be a Celtic? You know, and he asked it in different ways. And it wasn't that he was trying to, you know, be explicit about what he was trying to get out of the janitors and the assistant coaches and the training staff and, and players and down the line. But he was really trying to get an understanding of what it meant to be a Celtic before he started to implement the changes that he had on his mind. Now, you coached a different Celtics team in, in Ireland, but what was your approach in terms of information gathering when you got that job last year? Yeah, and I love how Brad Stevens wanted to like identify like the traditions that had been established there. For me, it was right away, what's the story people are telling? You know, do people love playing here? Do people not like playing here? Do, are we winners here? Is it like, a, do they have a winning mindset? Um, are we really highly, you know, like you mentioned there, like when it comes to commitment, I, I think one of the, the, the traps sometimes as, as a coach can be to come in and just like to want to observe the behaviors, the things that people do, you know, like, and I think it's great to sit down and maybe watch film and identify, okay, is it, are they, you know, do they play competitively or are they are they competitors and stuff, but you know, are, is there great bench energy? But I think you want to go even deeper than that. I think you really want to start to try to observe or gather information. At least I did on how are people not just acting here, but how are people talking and how are people thinking? You know, it comes back to this, like this mindset that they carry um, and like thinking about, you know, the program, the team, thinking about each other. Uh, what is their thoughts towards a coach? You know, like, are they traditionally fairly respectful towards a coach? They see that as an important factor in there. You know, what is, what do they see my role as? And I, I think that's just, it was early on. I just wanted to gather a lot of information on what people, not just were acting or what they were doing, but I wanted to get information on their thoughts their thoughts and the kind of the talk around the culture as well. I'm curious, JP, what did you find? Like what were some of the narratives that were particularly insightful for you as you got started? Well, so they had a great tradition in the sense that I could really resonate with many of these women on the team had been playing for that club for 10 plus years since the, the club's foundation. And they had gone on this arc where they were pro, they were a pro team, but a lot of them were like they were a really young pro team in the Irish league, and they were just got their butt whooped for years, right? They were getting just drilled, uh, but then they got better and got better, and eventually they like reached the top. They won the league, like you know, uh, in the in the championship, like four years. Um, but then the year previous, they had like this really down year. So it was like they reached the top, but they were like kind of like on a downspin, and and so it was like this idea. But I just kind of like, there's this tradition of like, we work really hard here. We're highly committed. They saw that in themselves. Like we accomplished something great through a lot of great work. Yes, we need good, you know, paid pros to be brought in. But it was, I just really resonated. And that kind of got me excited to work with that team because there was that tradition there. The same time I started to uncover other little things where there was potentially division between the players that played a lot and the players that didn't play a lot. And, and there was, this older generation of players, but we wanted to bring in new players and they didn't maybe necessarily feel as motivated or feel like there was a spot for them. So you started to see potentially some obstacles or challenges moving forward as, as you know, where was this program going to go next in the, in the next few years? And that all came from really mostly just conversations with the players. I want to push on you a little bit more with that, you know, when you say conversations with the players, was that, you know, one-on-one -on -one setting? Did you do it in groups? Did you use Google Forms? Because I think, you know, a lot of coaches will resonate with, boy, it'd be awesome to, you know, be able to discover and uncover some of the perceptions within the program or of the program from the outside. But trying to get people to be forthcoming and, and honest initially, you know, in some respects, is maybe easier because it's kind of a reset when a new coach has come in, but it's also a bit of a challenge because you don't have the rapport and the relationship established with those players. So how did you go about gathering um, and sort of poking around to get some of that information? Well, it's, it's interesting you ask that because I think this is where I wanted players to be comfortable early on just to speak up, but I know that there's not always like the, this one setting that works for everyone. 
So like, I really advocate for all that, even the coaches that I work with to, to come at it from different angles, you know, and that is to schedule some one-on-ones and, and with players. Now this was during COVID. So I could meet players outside for a coffee and I gave them that option. I'll buy you a coffee. I'll buy you lunch, we meet outside. At the same time I was offering, they could hop on a phone or they could even do a, a video chat. You know, I gave them that option. Uh, so they were, and they could choose one of those three, whatever that was most practical and most comfortable for them. And honestly, we probably had three or four players that wanted to meet me in person. We had a few players that wanted to meet on like some sort of video chat. And some were like, this is awkward. I'm just going to choose the phone option, right? Uh, because they never had a coach reach out to them like that, you know, before the season. So it was different. The same time I used a Google form, which I initially, I, sometimes I like to do those anonymous because I'm like, we need to really see if some stuff can come to the surface as far as problems. But I, had, I hadn't been there before, so I was comfortable having them put their name down. I didn't think that'd be a big issue. And, and, and some players, I think, are just better able to articulate with more thoughtful answers and responses by typing them up rather than in a conversation with me. And so it's once again, I'm just gathering this information and I'm learning and I'm taking notes through that process. So it was kind of those two things, as well as I started to then call around the country. And there's a lot of people I know in, in Ireland that are, are basketball coaches. And I started to ask other people, and I did this before I even took the job. Hey, what do you think about this, this club? What do you think about the administration? What do you think about the players? I, I talked, I called the former coach. I set up a call with her. Asked, I wanted to go through the roster of her thoughts on all the players, her thoughts on the program. I was just trying to see where, where you know, what she thought from, um, from her experience there. So it was this big kind of this information gathering kind of uh, journey for me. Now, at the same time, I don't think that that type of process nearly works for everyone. I'm here coaching a you know, pro team with you know, adult, adult women. And your process is for a high school you know, basketball team. And so what's that look like for you? Well, I think similarly, you know, that in information gathering process starts in the interview process, right? Because you're trying to get as wide a view of, again, what you would be walking into and how you can address some of the needs that, you know, you can uncover even before you get the job. So, you know, in my situation, as I was preparing for the interview, I mean, I talked to coaches in the league. I, you know, I talked to administrators in the league about the AD. I talked to people in the community. I talked to people who had kids in the district. I talked to coaches that work at Mount Vernon. I talked to former coaches that used to be at Mount Vernon. Uh, I talked to people in the media that have covered Mount Vernon, you know, so I really tried to reach out and anybody that had a contact point with the Mount Vernon school district or athletic program, I tried to talk to just to again, get their perspective on, you know, not just where the girls basketball program was at, but, you know, even a wider perspective on the athletic culture and the community and that sort of thing. So um, I think that process starts as soon as you take an interest in a, in a job somewhere. So for me, once I got the job, you know, now all of a sudden people are reaching out to you and just being welcoming. And, you know, so that opens a door to be able to have conversations and uh, whether that's with, you know, again, coaches of other programs, or you're obviously talking with administration now that you have the job on a different level. Um, and I think just starting to, to search for information anywhere you can find it. I remember when I first got into the huddle library and, you know, there's, there's access to film and you can figure some things out in terms of what were they running before strategically and tactically, but I also found some practice film, you know, and you could watch a little bit of just how they practice, maybe what they're used to. Um, you can see a little bit of what assistant coaches were doing the year before. Um, and then just, again, having conversations with, for me, it started with the coaching staff. And then the seniors were really the first two groups that I really tried to engage with um, to start finding out, again, what are we getting ourselves into and where do we begin? And it's cool that you mentioned like how you're reaching out to different people in the community. I, I've had some coaches that I work with in the mentorship program and whether they're taking over a program or even some that are returning. Is it even like taking over a new program? They've spent this off season reaching out to teachers or professors or just other people in the school community to ask them their thoughts in the program. You know, I think that's just, you know, you know, what do you think of the basketball team or the football team? You know, what's your impression of the players there? And, um, and I think that was pretty profound. Some of the feedback they got and those people just appreciated being asked, you know, like, I think it's a very empowering thing to come in and ask those type of questions of people. And that's, you know, some people are going, okay, well, what do we talk about in these one-on-ones? Well, it's less talking. It's probably more listening and asking great questions and, and following up on those questions with more questions, because, you know, that's, that's what you're really coming in there to do is not so much share your own philosophy and ideas. It's we're trying to gauge where they're at. 
my three favorite questions, if you're looking for questions to use, are really comes back to Mike Abershoff, uh, who's been on the podcast before, Captain Mike Abershoff. Um, you know, he wrote the book, It's Your Ship. You know, he talks about, you know, he was on, when he took over USS Benfold, he asked the three simple questions of all 312 sailors in the first six weeks. What do you enjoy about, you know, being on the ship? What don't you enjoy? And what's one thing that you would change? And he sat down with them and asked all three. And I think those are three really simple questions. Uh, and they're good questions to ask. And one of the things I love about them is that they start from the good. And I think it's easy to fall into this thing of like, let's talk about all the trash and all the issues. And so a lot of times people are going to want to do that. But you want to start from like, what's been working here? You know, whether you're, you know, if you're asking, you know, uh, former assistant coaches or the former head coach, like, hey, what worked here? Um, asking players, like, what, what did you enjoy about this experience? Starting from the good, I think, is a really important place because you don't want to, I don't think you want to start coming in there and creating this narrative of like bashing the coach or bashing the way that things used to be because you'll lose people pretty quickly. Like I know that there's times that I did that as a coach in 2012, I started to lose my team because I kept, I kept having this narrative, this, this story that I was telling them of like, things are going to change. They're not going to be the way they used to because you guys were lazy, you're entitled. And, and that's just not a way to call them up, you know? So I think those are some good questions, but starting from the positive, you know, what's been working here? What do you enjoy? That would be a huge recommendation. One of the other things that I tried to do when I first got the job is just to get an opportunity for the team to be together. And so, you know, over the years, we've really liked to kick off our summer with a, a kind of a mini camp where we talk about culture and we do some team building activities and things like that, even before we start our summer workouts, because I think that gives us a good momentum going into the summer. And so one of the activities we did this year at our mini camp was a conversation um, with and without seniors. And so I had my assistant coaches uh, in the classroom with all of our non-seniors. And I took our four seniors or three seniors out of the room. And we had the same conversation, but separately. And basically what the coaches in the room were asking the rest of the team was, what can the seniors do for this team this year to get the kind of experience that we had described over the first two days of camp? Uh, and essentially, that could be boiled down to they want basketball to be a place that they look forward to going to because it hasn't always been that way. And so we're just asking what role can seniors play in that? So they, they talked about that and we really wanted to boil it down to like, what are two things that seniors can do? And what's one or two things that you don't want the seniors do to do that would prevent us from having that experience. Then I took the seniors out at the same time and asked the same questions, but from a little bit different perspective of, you know, it's different being a senior and it's different, you know, in year one, we're going to, we're going to learn from the senior class, either positively or negatively, but also talk a little bit about just how it feels different that senior year. You know, there's an urgency when you know it's the last time you're going to put the jersey on, the last time you're going to have a lot, of, a lot of last experiences, right? And so asking them, what can the team do to help you have a great senior year experience so that you look back, number one, at the end of the year and think, I don't want this to be over. And we'll look back fondly at that, you know, long after your playing career is done. And similarly, ask the seniors to come up with one or two things the team can do, one or two things that they don't want them to do. Now, this seems like a really practical approach, but what came out of these conversations was really a lot of the information that you talked about before in terms of what are some of the narratives that have kind of been dominant around the program um, or some of the things that have been you know, said internally that kind of shaped the experience in the past and how they wanted to undo those things. Not only did it, it surface some of those, but it also directed us in a way where it was action oriented. It was solution oriented. It wasn't just, gosh, coach, we, we just want it to be a little bit more positive in the locker room and, you know, positive in, in, okay, well, what one or two things that are, that we can do as a team to get to that point. Right. So it's really focusing them more forward on what behaviors can they bring? What things do they want to bring change to versus just looking back, like you said, and saying, oh, we just don't want it to be like that anymore. Um, and I think that was really, really valuable. Maybe the best thing that we did in our first three days of minicamp over the summer to set that tone and allow that conversation to take place. And what I think you're doing an exceptional job of in that, that activity with the team is you're getting them to move from issues to solutions, which I think is really, really a critical skill or strategy as a coach to use from day one to the end. You know, it's like any, we want people to articulate issues or problems or things that need to change. 
but they also, we want to try to get them to start coming up with ideas or offering su suggestions about how to bring about that change. And, the, and, the, and why that's so important, I think, is because a few things. One is a lot of times their solutions will be things that we would agree with. There would be things that we would have offered, but when they come up with the idea, they're a little bit more bought into it, right? In, in that one sense. And so it becomes like really empowering. Like all of a sudden you're not becoming the change guy that's coming in and telling them, well, we're going to change this, change that, but they're, they're been empowered to be a part of that change. And like in your situation, you've, you didn't just come in and tell them like, this is the vision for the, for the program. You asked them what their vision, what would make the experience positive for them. So they've been a part of that. So now it's becoming, you haven't shared your vision. You've created a shared vision, which I think is, and, and they've been a part of not just that vision, but now starting to put together the process to actualize or bring that vision to reality. Now, I, I'm pretty sure you've experienced a little bit of this frustration that sometimes coaches get, which is just like you ask for suggestions or solutions. And the reality is they don't always know, you know, they don't always know. They just know they don't like the way things were going or the way things were being done. So what do you do in that space when you ask for like, hey, what can seniors do? And they don't, they struggle to come up with ideas or suggestions, right? Well, I think there's two things. I think number one, in our very first meeting with the team, you know, one of the three things that I shared with them that was really important to me is that I care deeply about what you think. They don't understand what that means practically going forward, but it sort of set the stage for me being able to follow up you know, on open gyms and say, geez, how'd open gym go today? What do you think about that? Or if we played in a scrimmage, what'd you think about that? Or, you know, whatever it might be, but starting to ask reflective questions that quite honestly, this has been the case at pretty much every stop that I've been at when I've started to use questions more is that players have never been asked before what they think of open gym, or they've never been asked about what kind of experience do they want to have or that type of thing, or what can they do as a senior to create that for other people? So when they struggle with that, I think oftentimes, you know, I'll just sort of move the conversation forward as you as you draw on a particular topic. So, if, for example, if your team says we want it to be a little more positive experience this year, well, how can we do that? Oh, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, what about this? You know, and I just kind of give them a menu of, you know, here's three or four other teams or other teams have come up with. What do you think? You know, is there one or two of these that we could start with? Right. And so sometimes. An open ended question. You kind of have to give them multiple choice. Um, and sometimes that I'm thinking, oh, I like that. What about this? You know, it may lead to something else that comes from that. So it's just, again, trying to help them maybe, just like you would brainstorm in any other situation, provide some ideas, maybe the next step in thinking and see if they can come up with something or agree with something on their own. So I can really relate to that. It's kind of one story I'll share here is when I was coaching last year at the Celtics, I was like, hey, we don't. What do you guys usually do for your warm up? You like your pregame warm up? And obviously, you can use these type of questions for anything about your program, but I just wanted to focus on the warm up. And they're like, well, we, we do this, 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 this. And I'm like, okay, how do you feel about that? Eh, we're not really a big fan of it. We've been doing it for the last kind of like 10 years, and it could probably be better. Okay, you guys got any suggestions? No, not really. You know, it's like, not really sure. You know, they, they maybe throw out a few things that they like. I said, well, what about? I run you through a warm up tomorrow in practice. And then you guys just let me know what you think of that. So I kind of was really intentional. I explained why I felt like this would be beneficial, ran them through it, and then asked for their opinion. They're like, oh, yeah, that was pretty good, but I might change this or that. And all of a sudden, it just becomes a, a real collaborative process where most of the change suggestions have come from me, but it's kind of been through their permission with their feedback. So we've been able to clean it up. So I think that's just one example of what that looks like in, in action. Well, I'll give you a counterpoint to that, JP. Earlier in the podcast, you talked about how there is a kind of a sliding scale from here's my vision and this is the way we're going to do things to let's collaborate and figure out what's going on here and, and you know, get the lay of the land and, and be a little more incremental. I remember when I, when I started at Mount Vernon, uh, it was before the open contact period in the state of Iowa. So they had a couple of open gyms before June 1st that we could be at and supervise, but we couldn't give any coaching instruction or direction. And so the players just kind of led those open gyms based on what they've done in the past. And I just remember thinking that, you know, we're, we're just not going to do any of these things once I can add structure to the open gym. And quite honestly, a number of those things are the product of 20 years of evolution in my thinking about skill development, that sort of thing. So rather than 
host a conversation in minicamp about, well, I see you guys have done these things in the past in open gym. What would you like to keep? And, you know, what do you think about this? I've just said, here's how we're doing open gym. It's going to be structured. It's going to, I'm going to lead it and give them a brief overview. We're going to shoot about half the time. We're going to play some small sided games to work on our skills. And then I'll check in with you and see what you think, you know? And so in that regard, we really did start from my vision and experience and just start something totally new. And, you know, I think the way that you can roll that out, as you mentioned before, you do want to be a little bit sensitive to the previous staff and, you know, they just haven't had the same experiences or trainings or, or whatever philosophies as I do. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and I didn't spend any time, you know, saying this is why we're doing this and not that. I just said, we're going to try this and we'll see how it goes, you know, and again, continue to look forward, continue to look for feedback. Um, but, but starting from something that I really believe in. So we've been talking a lot about the, you know, process of taking over a new program when it comes to players, but I think there's a whole other element that's very, very important, which is staff. You know, I think a lot of times there's staff retention, you know, and that's a really kind of another, another kind of type of relationship that you kind of have to tread carefully, uh, be intentional about. So how have you approached that this, this season? Well, I think when it comes to the question of retaining staff, you know, first of all, a lot of it is going to vary by circumstance. I've interviewed for jobs and taken jobs where the administration has, has told the previous assistant coaches, if the new coach comes in and they want to clean house and bring in all their own people, they're going to be able to do that. I've been in other situations where they've said, we want you to keep as many of the coaches as you can for continuity sake. Maybe they teach in the building, you know, maybe they're great coaches or they've got good rapport with players or whatever. And so I've always kind of leaned toward, I'd like to keep coaches if possible, because especially if I'm coming in new, that means I've got, you know, at Mount Vernon, 32 new relationships that I have to build with players. I would much rather have those players have existing relationships with returning coaches if they're positive ones. Um, and then, you know, as the coaches start to experience how we're going to do things, let them decide if that aligns with the way that they want, you know, what they want their experience to be like, if they want to be part of it and that sort of thing. Um, in the situation at Mount Vernon, the, the assistant coaching staff, I mean, everybody that I talked to and all those people I described before just gave rave reviews about the assistant coaches. And so I really made that a priority in week one. I want to meet with the assistants. I want to really encourage them, you know, to, to stay on board and kind of share the vision a little bit with them um, for all of those reasons. Now, some of those initial conversations can be a little bit delicate because who knows how long they've worked with the previous coach and, you know, what relationship they have with them. So you don't want to come in and say, okay, tell me what the old guy didn't do right, you know, or what, what we got to do bit better. And just, as you said before, just rip on the previous administration or the previous coaches. But I do think, you know, but I do think structuring your questions around things like, what was your role last year? You know, whatever their responsibilities were, what was your role on the bench? What was your role in practice? And trying to get them to articulate, first of all, how they were used or what responsibilities they had. But as they start to answer that question, as you listen really intently, you start to pick up on areas where maybe they were a little frustrated or they wish they did a little bit more. You know, I remember one of our assistant coaches said for her role on the bench, she said, well, basically I was just a cheerleader in varsity games. But the way that she said it was, I wish I had more to do than that, you know? And so I start pulling on that thread, you know, like, well, what else could you do if we gave you a little bit more freedom or what else would you like to do in practice? Or are there areas that you'd like to grow in a coach either in your responsibilities or things that you'd like to learn? So just, you know, again, it, it's focused as you talked about before, on solutions and growth and moving forward in the conversations with the coaching staff while drawing on their experiences, you know, their strengths and their desires for what they'd like to see their role to be moving forward. Yeah. And one of the mistakes that I made in this process years and years ago was I came to that conversation thinking I was the expert. And I'm not saying this as like kind of a, like a, to do this as a manipulative thing. I think it generally we should have the, the mindset of I am new here. <laughs> they are. They've, they were here before. They, ha they are more of an expert on the current state of the culture and the, the program than I am. And I need to come at that from that perspective. And so I did not take that perspective. But I do encourage coaches now to come into that conversation and just say, just be honest about that. Like, hey, you have a much better idea of what, how are things going in here? And you probably got some pretty good ideas on the things that need to continue to keep, we need to continue to do, the things that we need to stop doing, and maybe some things that we need to start doing but starting from that continued place. But really, I think it's trying to empower them that you, 
because that sets the stage for the relationship. Like if they do stay, you want them to speak up. You want them to offer solutions for change and ideas. You want them from the very first conversation to feel respected, to feel like their opinion matters. Uh, not just because they're going to be more likely to come work for you, but because that's going to be a great coaching staff culture, which you want to create from day one. And so I think that conversation is absolutely critical. Yeah. And, and one simple way to do that, JP, we did this when I took the job at Lindmark, because I agree, like I'm, I feel like I'm an expert in what I've done in the past, but I'm a novice when it comes to understanding the culture of a new school. So we had in one of our early coaching meetings, we did the timeline of the girls basketball program at Lindmar and just had them, you know, one of the assistant coaches had coached there for 12 years. She had played at Lindmar before that. She had a lot of institutional knowledge, right? And so I had the assistant coaches plot on the whiteboard going back as far back as they could remember, understand, you know, 1984, here's when, you know, Lindmar made it to the state tournament, blah, blah, blah. So the timeline kind of went up and down based on where the program was at, rising to new heights or <laughs> perhaps falling to new lows. So we could sort of see the trajectory over the last 20 or 30 years, but not only that, also then reflect on, you know, what was happening in the program when it was on the rise or when it was on the decline. And just again, kind of creating a conversation and an appreciation for the knowledge that they had that I didn't in a way that was very practical. So that was a, a really good approach for us. So as I was having conversations just last year with the Celtics and I'm kind of creating this running list, like this document of things I would call maybe issues or things that I want to change. Now, for me and you as well, like we're both very much like we want to innovate. We want to change everything. Like everything, my, one of my, my mantras is, you know, there's always a better way. Like we can always improve the way we do stuff. But I think you've got to kind of identify what are the things you'll focus on early on. And so I kind of keep the, you know, I had this running issues list of, things that need to change. And this was stuff that I observed or people made suggestions on. But as I did that, I think the other thing that you really had, I tried to engage was what was the appetite for change? And for that situation, there was kind of a little bit of a, a story or narrative of like, we weren't good last year because we got away from doing the things that we used to be good at. But even some of those things I used to be good at that led them to being a championship team, they weren't the way that I wanted to do things. You know, They weren't the type of, the type of defense or offense or the type of culture. So I knew that I didn't necessarily just want to go back to the way they did it two or three years ago. I wanted to potentially introduce new things, but I had to gauge that appetite. And I think that's really challenging. In a lot of ways, JP, what you're describing there takes us all the way back to the prologue and what we heard from Matt Doherty, that when he was brought into Notre Dame, he was brought in to bring change and do things differently. When he was brought in North Carolina, he thought that he was brought in to do things differently differently at North Carolina to bring change and bring what he did at Notre Dame when the reality was he was brought in to do what Dean Smith had always done before him and that created conflicts that eventually cost him his job so having an understanding of what is the appetite for change and I think a lot of that is contextual I think you know when I look at my last two years of experience being an assistant coach at North Lynn and just trying to bring some new ideas to the, our mental health days or to the way that we practice you know there were some resistance from a few players because rightfully so they've been to six of the last eight state tournaments you know coach Whitley's won over 300 games doing it the way they've always done it you know and so for somebody just to come in off the street and say well why do we practice like this why don't we do that instead it, it, again the question becomes but why do we need to do anything different you know when I come in at Mount Vernon it's a totally different situation where the team was one in 20 last year they're not coming off a state championship uh, and the number of wins has gone down each of the last couple of years. And so there's a much bigger appetite for we need something different. We want it. We're ready to try something different because what we've been doing hasn't been getting the results that we want. So having an understanding of that landscape is really, really important and helps to inform how do I approach this? How much can I ask? You know, how much can I bring change at the beginning versus how much do I need to pick and choose and just sort of take things incrementally one thing at a time? And the last thing I would say to that, JP, and this is really hard, like I didn't figure this out at Linmar, and I think this became part of the problem at the end was you have to try to find an understanding of what are the sacred cows, if there are any. If there's a long tradition of seniors playing, then you better be aware of that. You know, if you try to upend that and start playing underclassmen because they're better, it's one thing if you win a state championship and the team is markedly better, then I think it's easier to justify that. But if you're going to be 
three percent better because you, you played underclassmen and it's going to create a firestorm because we've always dressed upperclassmen we've always played seniors that's something that you'd like to be aware of before you make that decision and how you tease those things out i think again as you talked about before asking questions what are things we don't want to change and also i think previewing your ideas before you commit to them so if you do have something that you know we want to make it a, a culture of earning for example well here's what that would mean do we want to start selecting the varsity roster based on just ability or do we want to factor in being an upperclassman and having that conversation before you just take the plunge can start to reveal some of those things where there may be more resistance to change i think that's a great point i think there's a lot of coaches that say well I shouldn't have to have that type of conversation, you know, like we shouldn't have to tiptoe or walk, you know, walk through this process. Like I know it needs to be done. I just want to go make it happen. And my encouragement, if you have that type of mindset or you struggle with that type of mindset is to remember there's a difference there, there's, is to remember there's a difference between being right and being successful. <laughs> and if you want to be successful with the culture changes, it doesn't mean you just, you're, you know, what's right, you know, like the right change or the right offense, like, being successful means that there's buy into that. And then you're meeting people where they're at to help them to kind of, you know, buy into those type of changes. And it's like you said, gauging the appetite is, is so important. JP, what you just described there reminds me of the first video game that I ever played with my dad, which was called B-17 Bomber for Intellivision. This is back in the early 1980s. And in the game, you were a, a bomber pilot and you'd fly these missions over Germany. But when you started every level, you could pick your target. And when you looked at the map, not only did you see an airstrip or an oil refinery or a factory, but you also saw the anti-aircraft guns that were around it. And if there was a fighter base, you know, that would come up and they'd attack your plane and you'd figure out how far away it was and how many bombs you could take and how much gas it took. In other words, you had to count the cost before you took on the mission. And how you layered those missions, like it made more sense to take on the fighters um, Air Force base first and then the factory that was on the other side rather than doing it in reverse order. And I think when we when we are gathering information about where do we want to bring change first as we take over a program, the more intelligence you have, the better decisions you're going to be able to make because you understand the cost and you understand the areas where there may be more resistance than others. And, and I think that you can't replace that, especially early on when you're making some of your first decision. Now, in next week's episode, we're going to talk about another very, very important element to taking over a new program. And that is the relationship part. Like, how do you start to build those relationships? Because I really think it ties in with what we just you just shared there, Nate. I think the stronger those relationships, the more connections that you can have, you, you can form early on the more likely you are to be successful with change and probably move change at a faster pace.